Okay, so there's something I wanted to talk about today because I am very <laughs> upset by it and I think it's really important to talk about. So two days ago on December 3rd, there was a man named Priyantha, uh, let me get his last name right, Thea Wadana, and he was a Sri Lankan citizen working in uh, the state of Punjab in Pakistan as a general manager of a factory. And there was a rumor that was spread that he had ripped down a poster and that this poster contained some sort of Islamic scripture. Reports vary. Some say that it had uh, verses on the Quran on it. Some say that it had um, parts of a Hadith, uh, which is like Islamic scripture that contains the teachings and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And then some say that it was um, supporting the radical Islamist group, uh, Tariqi Labaik Pakistan, or TLP. And before anyone says that I'm dog whistling by calling it a radical Islamist group, I'm not. <laughs> that is literally just a descriptor of this political party in Pakistan. This man was tortured alive, beaten by hundreds of people, and his body was set on fire in the middle of the street while people took selfies with the burning corpse. You can go watch the videos like I just did. Now, I am really fucking pissed at the Prime Minister Imran Khan because this is one of the few instances where he's actually calling out the blasphemy frenzy that has taken a hold of his nation, okay? Most other circumstances, he is one of the primary causes in strengthening and bolstering this frothing out the mouth frenzy. People might think I'm using extreme language right now. I wish I was. So a lot of this has to do with this political group, like I said, the TLP, that is literally founded on protecting and strengthening the blasphemy laws of Pakistan. Now, for those who are not aware, the blasphemy laws in Pakistan are that if you are accused of blasphemy, this is a charge that is punishable by death. Now, people will be quick to say, oh, Susanna, no one has actually been executed by the state for blasphemy, and you would be correct. But that is because usually people get lynched by a mob before they ever reach death row. <laughs> like, I'm not exaggerating, this is empirically true. And you are actually safer on death row in Pakistan for blasphemy than you would be not under police custody. And I'm not acting like you know, death row in Pakistan is a cakewalk, okay? This is just so you can get some perspective and know what the relative dangers are. This issue of blasphemy has, it's, it's reaching a fever pitch in Pakistan. If you look at the numbers of the cases of people who have been charged with blasphemy, it has skyrocketed in the past two years. It's becoming a huge problem and more ne people need to pay attention to it. Now, the reason why I'm so pissed at Imran Khan is because I'm happy that he's calling it out. Of course. He's only calling it out because it's a foreign national. This man was Sri Lankan. And now he has to be concerned about how this looks on the world trade and in terms of incentivizing foreign investment and making sure that foreign workers actually remain in the country. It's because it threatens that aspect of it. He doesn't actually give a shit. You want to know why? Because he doesn't say dick. Doesn't say dick. When multiple times a month, the particularly the religious minorities of Pakistan are lynched, persecuted, accused of blasphemy, get the shit beaten out of them, chased out of town, whole communities burned because of mere allegations of an insult to the Prophet Muhammad or his companions. It, it, it keeps on extrapolating further and further outward. As an example, I could give you dozens of examples because I'm way too knowledgeable about this. Less than a month ago, according to the police in Peshawar, 
thousands of people descended on the police station because they were demanding that the police hand over a man who was reportedly mentally unstable to the point of being nonverbal so that they could lynch him. The police evacuated that man and, and they had to evacuate the entire police force and then call in military because they burned down the police station because they refused to let this mob lynch someone who's intellectually disabled over accused desecration. This is how serious it gets. And we need to pay more attention to this for a number of reasons. One, the power that the TLP, which is one of the primary galvanizing forces behind this blasphemy frenzy in Pakistan, um, we, they have a power of mass mobilization in the country that threatens the power of the civilian government. They are scared shitless of the power of the TLP. Recently, they were going to mobilize on the capital. To stop this, the government literally started digging up trenches in the highways so that they couldn't enter the capital. And then they had to negotiate with this group because they have no choice. If if, if like, I obviously have a lot of criticisms of the Pakistani army. I mean, I could go on for days, but that is the only thing preventing the TLP from just doing like a 1979 style Islamic revolution and taking over Pakistan, which is one of the most terrifying possibilities in the world because Pakistan has nuclear powers. To give you some perspective, the original founder of the TLP, Haram Hussein Rizvi, literally was preaching that they should nuke France because of the issue of that France actually protects freedom of expression in their country and this inherently means the protection and the right to blaspheme. Because of that, he was advocating for the entire country to be wiped off the map. Okay? And this country actually has the nuclear capabilities to do so. I mean, if, I mean, if the TLP came to power, there's so many other consequences that I like can't even get into. but. I want to talk about this for a couple of other reasons. One, because I want more people to care about what's happening in Pakistan. I want more people to actually care about the prosperity of the Pakistani people enough to give a shit about this. What, what, what does this mean to me? There, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because there would be an Islamic revolution if it did happen. But the, the, the blasphemy laws in Pakistan need to be repealed, period, okay? This is why I get so fired up about the importance of enshrining free speech and free expression into law. Free speech and free expression is the bedrock of liberal democracy. And I want that prosperity that comes with that in protected right for the Pakistani people. Every other right that we are afforded is predicated on the maintenance of free speech and free expression. Because if you do not have that right, you do not have the ability to then go fight for your other rights. It's, it's foundational. And I want more people to understand that. And because I want more people to understand that, I want more people in my community, in my country, or other Western developed, whatever, whatever country, free societies, however you want to put it, to understand and appreciate in their hearts what we have. And not only do I want us to appreciate it, I want us to protect it above all else. And I want us to fight for and support the people in other countries who are working to main, to achieve this for their own societies. Because there are too many left-leaning people who act like it is somehow a right-wing position to be really hardcore about the protection of free speech. I understand where this attitude comes from because people don't like hateful speech. Of course, I understand that. I'm incredibly sympathetic to it. But we don't get to pick and choose when it comes to free expression. 
And the fact that sometimes people paint me as being somehow alt-right because I recognize that I don't actually have the authority to pick and choose what's acceptable or not speech be for all the reasons that I've just painted out, it's it drives me insane. It really does. It also really bothers me that when I talk about these issues out of my own care and desire for goodness and prosperity for people in other countries, specifically people in Islamic countries, people try to paint the criticisms that I have as some sort of racism or bigotry. And I just want to break down how ridiculous this is. My criticism of an ideology, an idea such as Islam, is not a denigration of the people who believe or practice that ideology. Okay? There's a there's a difference between an idea and people. Ideas don't have rights, people have rights. And I understand where a lot of the criticism comes from because in my context in America, Muslims are a minority and it's a, a um a value of being on the left that you protect minorities and but people are being american centric and too narrow in their focus when they neglect to realize that just because there there are there is a minority here that does not mean that they are not a majority elsewhere okay and every group of humans has the potential to do horrific things to another group whenever they are the majoritarian group. If you deny this, you are actually the racist because you are denying the complexity of the human experience to that group just because they are minority in your community. And once you are denying that complexity to a group, you are actually the one engaged in dehumanization. Okay? And so I'm someone <laughs> who really values liberalism, real ass liberalism. And like I said, to me, one of those core tenets and values is protection of minority groups. And this extends beyond my own community. I'm concerned about the minority groups that exist around the world. And this includes the minorities within Muslim majority countries, okay? They, especially in Pakistan, the systemic brutalization that minorities face in Pakistan is hard to exaggerate. I, so many stories are just flooding my mind right now. I, I can't even think of what to give as, as an example first. Take for, ex, ex, for instance, the Ahmadi Muslims. Now, for those who are, don't know, Ahmadis are an extremely persecuted um, Muslim minority sect, and they are extremely persecuted because they believe that there is um, a prophet that comes after the Prophet Muhammad. Um, this is seen as extremely heretical um, to m m most every other sect, and Basically, they don't recognize Ahmadis as Muslims. They believe that they are infidels. And worse than just being infidels, they're actually engaged in heresy, innovation, or bidda. So they are corrupting Islam. This is extremely um, seen as blasphemous. And they are, Ahmadis face basically ongoing genocide and ethnic cleansing in Pakistan, where they are openly assassinated on the street and to be able to receive a Pakistani passport you have to declare that Ahmadis are not Muslims. The state is engaged in the takfirin of Ahmadis. It's in the con there was a constitutional amendment over it just to like give you an example. Um, and so when people try to say that I have some sort of bigotry against Muslims, for example, I it really makes me upset because this actually comes from a 
desire for the protection of Muslims. For example, Ahmadi Muslims, Shia Muslims in Pakistan also face this. I remember watching videos of a Shia man accused of blasphemy being axed in the street, chopped up in the street. And not only that, even if it wasn't about the minorities, I can give you empirical evidence that those who are most persecuted either by the law or by mobs for the accusation of blasphemy are Muslims. It's a fact. I, like, you want, you want the proof? I can give you the proof from my, our own State Department, okay? Um, and it... Ugh, fuck. I... I want so much better for the Pakistani people. And it's impossible to happen while this fervor of blasphemy has gripped the nation, where there are few more important policies that politicians campaign on other than constantly claiming that they affirm the finality of the prophet the most, that they love the seal of the prophet the most, which is an anti ahmadi platform. Um, a lot of people, out of goodwill, they, they will point to other factors besides um, the ideology of Islam that drives these sorts of incidents. And I understand where they're coming from. And um, I can give some credence to that to a certain extent. Let me explain. So the ruling class, the state apparatuses of Pakistan use Islam and Imran Khan himself, this piece of shit, is responsible for such a depth of increasing the Islamization of Pakistan within their educational system and throughout civil society. It's insane. But they, they use, um, they, they use increasing and, and deepening this obsession with Islam and making everything about the pride of Islam, everything about the victory of Islam as a way to, as, as a nationalizing force. And it's a way for them to cover up and not acknowledge and not focus on their own failures to actually govern well. And this is why Islam is becoming increasingly intertwined in sports in Pakistan, because across the world, sports are used as a nationalizing force. And now they're just knitting the two more and more together because they don't have other reasons that they can bring to their people to be proud of their nationality. So I can give people that, right? Um, however, when people try to deflect and say, oh, it's only sociopolitical, geopolitical factors that leads to this kind of thing, they're actually tacitly acknowledging that, that, oh, it's only geopolitical factors that leads to fundamentalism. Yes, that is very important. Socioeconomic factors that deepen fundamentalism. However, when you're saying that, you're tacitly acknowledging that it is the fundaments, the fundaments of Islam that actually carry these teachings, these attitudes, that they imbue these attitudes into people. And I'm not going to stand for anyone trying to act like the lynching in the street of this Sri Lankan man is not informed by Islam when their murderers are literally being interviewed by news stations citing the Hadith themselves saying it, it cannot get more clear when they're telling you it's because of what they were taught from Islam. You're doing a disservice to the victims when you try to cape for an ideology like this. You're harming Muslims because if you actually think that trying to protect and shield um, the, the ideology, the way that people are taught these ideas out of a love for the people or protection of the people, which is very, very worthy, you're harming the people. You're harming Muslims because they are the ones who are most likely to actually be harmed and killed over these things. Statistically, it's just a fact. And I really hope that more people pay attention to stuff like this. I hope that more people um, value the rights that 
we are lucky if you are if you do live in a country that is lucky enough to have this really enshrined into law that you're grateful for it and that you protect it and i want more people to care about what people who don't have this right go through and people really need to ask themselves what is more important what is more upsetting is it someone taking a book and ripping a piece of paper is that more upsetting or murdering someone over ripping a piece of paper if you want to learn more about what's going on in pakistan i highly suggest you go follow hara sultan on youtube great friend of mine and of course, I'm going to say go follow Atheist Republic. Um, we talk about issues in Pakistan at least once a week. And um, also follow Ali Rizvi, great friend of mine, and um, Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment, which is a fantastic podcast. Um, obviously, this is something I'm very passionate about and I care a lot about. And I hope um, that this taught you a little bit about why this issue is so important.